Thanks for tuning in. Today's podcast is brought to you by SmartBridge. Hey everyone, welcome back to this Transform IT podcast. We have a special guest today, uh, Stephen Fine from Buckeye Partners. Now, Stephen, like uh, like we always do when we bring our subject matter experts in, a lot of the people that are listening to this podcast may not know who you are or what you do. So we're wondering if you could just give us a kind of a, a basic rundown of your roles, responsibilities, what you do, and why basically people should consider listening to you. It's a fair, fair request. My name is Stephen Fine, as uh, they introduced me. I am someone uh, who has been a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Started out in the finance arena, did a little bit of IT, a little bit of consulting. Uh, Throughout my entire career, I've been involved in process improvement, whether it include IT uh, technology or the business process itself and and getting on a fantastic Visio and putting a a nice process together. Um, So RPA translated very easy. Uh, for me because it's just the marriage of the technology and the business process. All right. So that segues into the uh, basically the t- conversation topic of today, which is RPA. Um, so before we start, we do have a lot of, uh, we have a RPA day and a bunch of other media um, put up. Our marketing team has done a really good job. So if you want to follow up and you want to look into that, we already have a bunch, um, a bunch in place. But with that said, one of the things that I talk about and I, you know, I see with people is that, you know, you talk about RPA, um, AI, you know, machine learning, and a lot of people kind of conflate all three of those. They don't know what the differences between those are. And it's just kind of like, ooh, machines doing stuff over there. And, you know, they, th- they think a lot of people think they're actual robots. Um, my question to you is before we really get started and dive into RPA, can you do a little high level overview of the difference between RPA, machine learning, AI, and maybe a kind of a use case for each one of those? And then we can come back and focus on the core of what we wanted to talk about today. Yeah, that's a good question. As a business person first, one of the big gaps that you always have is, um, technology terms fly around. When you think of robotic process automation, I want everyone to visualize a computer basically performing a set of tasks, whether it is touching a keyboard or clicking on a browser. That's what the essence of RPA, replicating human actions. When you think about the artificial intelligence and the machine learning, the machine learning, I mean, that's the best term. It is a machine trying to understand and basically bridging the gap between task-oriented and that artificial intelligence. I consider that the gray area. I don't have an example uh, because I'm not on the journey that far, but when you think about machine learning, that's the cool stuff that Watson's doing. That's taking so much information and, and being its own human brain and making decisions. So when you think about it, uh, when you see the the, qual- the crawl, walk, run strategy of life, that's how I see RPA, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Okay, very very clear, very concise breakup of the three. I, I definitely appreciate that. My mother would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we're talking about RPA, let's get into it. Um, what's the biggest value proposition that you see related to RPA? When I think of RPA... I think of the struggle that I have had for two decades in business, maybe three. What is truly an IT responsibility and what is a business responsibility? RPA is a more simplistic way for the business to take ownership of their own technology. When you think about an Excel spreadsheet, there are macros. You can perform a macro and magically things happen in the background and you have a solution. RPA is an Excel macro on steroids. It is something that can ultimately be owned by the business, but IT doesn't have to worry at night when they try to go to sleep because the business can and will be able to run an RPA ship. Now, uh, before the podcast, we were talking a little bit just to get warmed up in our sound check. And one of the things that we had uh, briefly discussed was, you know, one of the big problems I see from my side 
in IT is that IT is still seen as a cost center, as a thing that has to happen and no one likes, no one wants to do. And it's just kind of this thing, like the redheaded stepchild mm-hmm. as um, uh, of the company. And um, one of the things that I was th- I was wondering is, do you see RPA as a way for the business to kind of take ownership or borrow some of the IT assets for a little while and see the benefits and help with that initial transition from IT is a cost center to IC, IT is enabling the business? What's interesting is when I have conversations with IT, uh, whether it's in my current business or previous businesses, they would get very frustrated because there was always a gap between business requirements and the true solution. Sometimes businesses wouldn't fully understand the actual impact of the request that they're making. So Mm -hmm. there's always be this gap between IT delivery and business expectations. From an RPA standpoint, you can remove that gap because you can enable the business to take ownership. Conversely, IT might get a little bit of heartburn. However, This would allow the technology people to really focus on technology and not address or invest as much time in problem solving for the business. They can be out in front looking at new technologies, looking at uh, more complex solutions and transferring what I would say more of a service desk mentality to a solution providing strategy. So the fundamental premise of becoming proactive instead of reactive Mm -hmm. with, you know, added in with the buy-in of the business because they can kind of see that value and see the, uh, see the, the work all come, all come in and actually provide them additional services and additional value. Absolutely. So there's a key element there that you mentioned was enabling the business. Mm -hmm. What does that look like specifically? When you say that, what does that exactly mean for someone who might not? Absolutely. Enabling the business is the business standing up and saying, I understand, I can solve a problem. It's a combination of autonomy and creativity. There have been businesses I've been in previously that whenever there's a problem, they go to IT. And what ends up happening is you create a culture where IT has to be the firefighters 24-7. And the business truly does not own what the solution to the problem is. When you think about process improvement, if you don't understand what the solution to the process problem is, you're never going to achieve something that's satisfactory. Yeah. And by enabling the business, you end up creating a situation where the business looks to IT as a partner Mm, instead of a service center. Got it. So it's more so thinking downstream, kind of doing each other's parts, doing the part that they need to do without adding more uh, work on the other, on IT, for example. Yeah, and in many cases, we, over the last 20 years, we have changed our mentality. The business has become more engaged, more proactive, whether it's in a company I've been in or uh, my colleagues at other companies. Businesses have become stronger as it relates to owning their processes and finding solutions instead of raising their hand at a certain point and saying, I have a problem. Yeah. Now that segues very well into one of the other, one of the topics or the questions that I had was, um, so we talked about the business taking ownership and process improvement, but when, when we're talking about RPA specifically, is there a certain type of industry or business that will benefit significantly more than others from implementing RPA? It's an interesting question because you know I, I, I deal with RPA on an everyday basis with my colleagues. I think it applies to everyone. Now, are there certain industries that would would be better off? I would assume some of the organizations that have not embraced technology as much as others. So I don't necessarily see it as industry specific. I see it as culture specific. If you are in an industry that um, has focused on larger implementations and not the smaller kind, RPA is probably going to be a fertile territory Mm. to explore. What about, what would you say something along the lines of 
professional services, you know, you're talking about anything from ITs to, you know, mm-hmm. to lawyers, things like that. That seems like a, at least on the surface, it seems like a very interactive, very human based kind of technology. Um, eventually, we're assuming that the technology will be embraced by most industries. But do you really see any type of disruption there? Or do you think that's going to have to wait till, you know, more of the machine learning and artificial intelligence develops so that it gets a, a higher value and it actually brings that together? I actually see RPA as, um, I, I guess the best way to describe it would be that this is the business case for machine learning and AI. There's a lot of business people uh, that may be skeptical mm-hmm. of artificial intelligence or machine learning. The foundation of both of those is through RPA. So by developing an RPA solution or an RPA culture, this will help your organization move forward and start to look to the future because the future isn't far with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So if you're not on board now, um, you may be a step or two behind your competitors and your industry as a whole. So you talked about RPA culture and those that element specifically. We're talking about what sets a company up for success when they're looking to implement RPA, mm-hmm. right? So culture beyond that, what are other elements that you that you think, in your opinion, provide the most value, and what is that value that comes out from it? That's a very open-ended question, okay. and I'll try to keep my answer to under twenty minutes. <laughs> An RPA culture, in my opinion, is really starts with understanding the organization. You need to understand the organization culture. You need to understand the organizational talent. You also need to understand what the strategy of the business is. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you are an organization that has a lot of talent, analytical talent. Mm -hmm. However, you have a number of tasks that's holding them back from actually growing because they're focused on day-to-day tasks. My foundation is accounting. In any organization, you will find day-to-day tasks that are preventing people from performing analysis. In those situations, RPA is a fantastic candidate. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you go to higher tech companies, they're a little further down the road and they don't necessarily need it as much. From a culture standpoint, you need to understand how you're going to get sponsorship to invest into RPA because, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, I'm sure there's a question coming, but the investment to RPA in the short term sometimes can be upside down because you need to build the path in order for people to be successful in the future. So three pieces to it. The first is what's your organizational culture, sponsor support, Mm -hmm. and the third one is your organizational talent. Because if your talent can't, can't overcome the technology, my company uses UiPath, yeah. If you don't have people that could use UiPath, you're not going to get anywhere with RPA unless you bring in a complete outsource structure. But yeah. I mean, so that that hits on the the fourth point that I guess it was implicitly um, discussed was that training is a big part of that culture shift as well. Mm-hmm. well what, whatever the tool, the technology, the processes, but you, not only do you have to define the path, but you have to bring the people in, you have to train them up on the tools and technologies to actually make it successful. Yeah, in in my organization, uh, we have a robust training program. Uh, The person who leads that, his name is Brian Sipes. And um, actually, uh, our COE is three people, Uh, Eric Gleason, uh, Brian Sipes, and myself. Brian has is an accountant just Mm -hmm. like me. And he learned the discipline of, uh, in our case, UiPath. He learned uh, not only the modeling side, but he also learned the process improvement side. Because with every RPA solution, there has to be a process to start with. And I think one of the areas that that we could explore, if you choose, is that RPA is basically process improvement wrapped into an application. And I think one of the areas that people don't realize is that Um, by focusing so much on the technology that you forget what you're trying to achieve. 
every piece of technology starts with how can we be better? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've seen is implementing some solutions here within our own company is that part of our process improvement is looking, analyzing those processes and realizing that a lot of them were put in because of human error or latency or other, we basically, we have baggage from when it was a hundred percent manual tasks Mm -hmm. and these checkpoints and redundant activities. So, I mean, that just, yeah, something as simply as simple as creating a user, bringing them on onto our domain was set up in about a 15 step process. And when we used, you know, we, we used the RPA, it was two bots mm-hmm. doing with one manual checks just to verify in the middle because we haven't had a hundred percent buy-in ourselves on this process. And it's a more of a test case than it is a full production implementation. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. You know, the way that I look at processes and, and is very, I look at it as a Lego set because here's what happens. Somebody comes in, they build a process, and then the next person comes in, and they don't want to completely change the process, but they want to tweak the process. Mm-hmm. So over time, what ends up happening is the whole spirit of a process may not achieve the original goal. And you have this Lego set that has a small foundation and all these pieces on top. Well, sooner or later, it's going to fall. One of the benefits that RPA has is that you standardize the process. So that if you you don't take, you don't embrace the human element of the little things we need to do. The best example of RPA I always give is if you want to document a process, you need to understand a process. Each one of us woke up this morning and walked out the door. I bet you if I put a million dollars on this table, all three of us would not be able to document every single step that we took. Yeah, no. However, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> well, first you got to find the million dollars to put on the table. I can't help you with that. But when you think about the when you think about the overall processes that people have, RPA takes the process down to the step-by-step level. We because in our digital age where we're looking at social media and such, no one really likes to get down to that that 10th 13th, 15th step of the process. Yeah. But in order to be successful in RPA, you have to swim in the details. And that makes people like myself or like the dance on clouds a little uncomfortable. But you have to be able to have that discipline. It's that discipline, yeah. But as you said, that when when you get down into that different level and you're really learning and understanding these processes, it looks like it's a prime time to go ahead and cut out all the... Uh, cut out all the extra and just get down to the brass tacks of this is actually what needs to happen. And the rest of this stuff is just fluff in the mix. Yeah. And what we found is that people have these little epiphanies when they go through the processes, they're like, Oh, why do I do that? And the reason why they do that is because in many cases you're performing a task and you're so focused on achieving the goal Mm -hmm. that you're not necessarily evaluating the journey. And that's one of the, again, one of the big pieces that RPA has is RPA is a journey. It's a yeah. journey to understand your process. It's a journey to automate the process. And it's a journey about, okay, I've done something significant here. I have free time. What's next? Now, with, with, we're talking about process improvement unintentionally or mm-hmm. intentionally in some circumstances being a great value driver um, when discussing and doing the analysis before you implement some type of RPA project. Now, I was wondering if you might be able to touch base on a few more value drivers and one of the ones that you would, if you were trying to convince your CIO, let's say they hadn't embraced this technology yet, you're trying to convince him, hey, this is what we need to do. What would you say is the biggest value driver and then some other cherries on top, as it were, uh, for additional considerations? One of the interesting things about RPA is that the benefits are more intangible than tangible. And that's where people get a little uh, a little worried about what is this technology. Mm-hmm. When I think about the benefits that RPA provides, there's three of them. The first one is, is your true tangible, your actual removed hours. So if we can use an example of, let's say someone in the cash world has to perform a certain role, cash role, daily basis, that's removed, that's easy. I can quantify that, I can hand someone an ROI, and someone can decide whether it meets their uh, acceptable hurdle rate. The second piece is called a frequency ROI. The frequency ROI 
is a situation where a task could be performed more often, but it doesn't because people only have a finite amount of hours. So let's use an example of an integrity report. If someone has an integrity report that they can't see information or a comparison of any kind, but they can only do it once a week, well, wouldn't it be great to do it every single day and have it come to someone's you know, doorstep via email or potentially a pop-up or what have you? That's a benefit that's hard to quantify, that frequency ROI. The third one is, all right, I just implemented something. I saved 20 hours a month. What is this person going to do? When I think about, when I think about the individual people, and I'm, I'm focusing on the staff level right now, we have an opportunity to get them more empowered because manual tasks sometimes demotivate people. The second part is that we can make them better because we could challenge them with more value-added analytics. It's critical in this day and age with low employment today that we keep our people. The cost to retain people is significant. So that third part is not only getting a better person, but I'm reducing the possibility of losing that person and the cost of finding and retraining. And you know me from my level, what I heard there <laughs> of, of all the different things is, uh, is my a phrase I say to the team a lot, you know, hey, and when they ask, hey, was that done? Did you did you finish that? Or, you know, let me get a status report. And I have to go back and say, sorry, guys, I was too busy working to get any work done. <laughs> right. And, and if you think about it from a manager standpoint, managers have a lot of meetings. I mean, yeah. I, I find me an organization that doesn't have managers that are in meetings at least 30, if not 70 percent of the time. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to know how that happens. From a manager standpoint, if your team can perform these tasks and then we could raise the level of the individual managers and automate some of that, now you have coaching opportunities. You have opportunities where you can work with your individuals and raise their game. Because when you're in an organization, you have two goals. One is to get things done as efficiently as possible. The second part is to build a succession plan so that you can take individuals, elevate them through the organization, and help them make the best decisions. And RPA is one of the elements that can do that. Now, on the flip side, you know, every everything has a dichotomy to it, right? There's a, it's a dual-edged sword, and you know, people talk about some things here, some things there. Now, one of the big benefits of RPA, at least from my experience, is accuracy, speed, and the fact that it, automation, right? Mm -hmm. So you're taking those man hours and, and the, the actual human error factor out of the equation. On the flip side, you take a look at it and you say, sometimes that human interaction, the human interface and the human touch is what's actually needed to perform a high quality service. Again, coming from the professional services world, I'm looking at it and saying, okay, I can do this. My competition can do this. But the fact that my people are here and they provide that experience, um, separates me from, you know, separates me from the competition. So in that circumstance, in that kind of, uh, under that field, do you think that the speed accuracy and the fact that it's automated will offset that cost of human interaction or that loss of human interaction? Or do you think basically we're going to still look at the hybrid model where the mundane tasks are taken care of so the humans can really focus on the higher value items? That's a very that. good question because that is, when you think about technology generation over generation, that is the question. Perfect example would be, um, actually this was something my colleague Brian brought up to me, washing dishes, right? We have a dishwasher. 60 years ago, we didn't have dishwashers. Well, that was quality time where you know people could hang out together and wash dishes all day long, right? Make them nice spick and span. That doesn't happen anymore. When you translate that to the work world, I, I struggle with I struggle with struggle with the concept that technology is bad. I think with RPA, one of the benefits that it has is it standardizes. The human element is great, but we are great creative minds. And part of being a creative mind is the lack of of standardization and the importance of individuality. I.e. we're messy. 
Well, messy's a strong word. Um, if I went to my kitchen today, um, yes, it would be messy. But the reality is, when you think about when you think about what we do best as the human race, is that we like to analyze. We like to validate. There's a number of things that RPA does that just basically makes that those irrelevant. There's examples all throughout. You know, I always use the example of my father. My father is is 72 years old. When he came into the workforce in the middle of the 60s, there is probably at least 30 to 50 percent of what his day to day was that has now been replaced by computers. I don't necessarily think we're looking back to the day where um, we want people back to pumping gas or back to doing ledger paper as an accountant. So we need to take the mentality that each one of these benefits us and focus more on how we can benefit and become better. I want to kind of go over the RPA, the fear around RPA, around artificial intelligence with, oh, am I going to lose my job? Mm-hmm. Can you talk uh, more specifically? Wow. No, uh, no, no, kind of easing into that one. <laughs> just a direct, hardcore yeah. question. Yeah, it's I mean, an it, important question. It is an important question, and the answer is yes and no. Yeah. So let's go back to that example about the guy pumping gas. Right? There are people twenty years ago that were performing roles that are similar to the guy pumping gas that are gone. Those roles don't exist. A lot of manual tasks. Yes, some people will not uh, translate into the new world, but it's also opportunities for people to learn skills, right? When you really think about it, we have five generations right now in the workforce. And if you think about, I would say, the elder two generations, the people that have been successful have been able to adapt. So the job you have today, much like the job 20 years ago, will cease to exist but we continue to move on. Started with the cotton gin, today it's RPA, tomorrow it's machine learning AI. There are other technologies that we don't want to know that, that we don't know about that quite honestly will remove. But if you think about the evolution of the workforce, the evolution of the workforce is how do you work around technology and leverage that to- technology to create new skills? Because the skills that I learned at Penn State in the uh, in the 90s mm-hmm. is different than what my daughter is learning right now in Texas State in the 2010s into the 2020s. Yeah. Go Bobcats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can definitely tell you again from personal experience that uh, it seems more and more, especially with more technology, the more connected we are, I'm always working. There's always more to do and there's never enough time to get it all done, especially not done, not finished in a, a way that I'm comfortable delivering it. And again, the small cases where we've rolled out RPA internally and things that we've seen has really actually shifted a lot of that stuff off so I can really focus on the higher value things. Oh, this is broken. We need to troubleshoot it. We need to, you know, analyze it, come up with a creative solution versus here, let me just click, 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 move, go and come back to that task where effectively a trained monkey could do it. Yeah. And and I'd like to add that I I don't want anyone to perceive this as a negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, If you think about what we do, right, 10 years ago, can someone tell me what Netflix was, right? No. Can someone tell me, you know, we are all evolving and this is no different. Our personal lives are evolving in some ways faster than the work world. Mm -hmm. So as we're evolving as people, this is a great opportunity for people to push themselves or potentially um, to give themselves new skills because in the journey of life, Um, we are challenged to be better day after day. And this is another opportunity for not only for us to potentially improve our skills, but to learn new skills. I didn't know about RPA a year and a half ago, but here I am on a podcast talking about it, faking being expert. (laughs) Well, I think fake is a strong word there that we may need to roll back because based on what you've told us so far. (laughs) Yeah, you seem very insightful about what you're talking about. So I think you're good there. Now, we talk about a year and a half ago that we, not not we as in everyone, but RPA just didn't have as much traction. It wasn't a big thing. It wasn't the, you know, it wasn't one of those buzzwords that we hear around all the time, but it is now. 
you know, when we look back at some old Gartner reports, of course, they're, I wouldn't say they're on the bleeding edge of everything, but I do go back and reference them for tools, technologies all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the magic quadrant is a great way to look at it. Um, an analysis um, last year said that RPA would grow by about 57%, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and what I wanted to understand is, you know, from the requests that we've received from our customers and other things and that people are talking about in the industry, I'd actually argue that it may have grown significantly more because now it seems like everyone and their dog has some test case, some development case that they're rolling out to, to try and just see whether or not this is something they want to they wanna move forward with. In your experience, um, at a significantly higher level and definitely seeing, uh, seeing operations from a, a, in a different field than we are, um, in your opinion, has do you think that fifty seven percent was accurate, or do you think it's more than significantly more than that? Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> the fifty seven percent is an interesting number because what does that fifty seven percent mean? Does that mean that fifty percent fifty seven percent more of the organizations are now adopting it? Is it that existing operations have now invested fifty seven percent more? into RPA. So I don't know what the basis of the number is, but Mm -hmm. I can tell you this. When I see an article on CNN about RPA taking away jobs as it was, I think (laughs) it was this week on CNN, when it reaches what I would say the major media, that means that it's getting eyeballs. I would say 57% is probably low. I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of pilots that are probably going on. On our journey, we have some peers uh, that are ahead of us. Some are right along along the lines with us. It would be hard for a business right now of of a larger scale to actually not at least have a discussion about RPA because of the value proposition it provides. So you say you would say you know without the the specific numbers and metrics in front of you that. At least it's not only is it gaining significantly more traction, but it's really it's become a common word that people are actually thinking about. And it's a uh, it's a mainstream idea, as it were. Right. When you think about RPA, what are the benefits? When I say the benefits of RPA, the benefits that an organization might take the risk of, of being involved in RPA. The first one is that it's got a low barrier to entry. Right. I could go right now and I could download the software on my computer for my own personal benefit. Right. That is an important piece. It's not an ERP. I don't need to throw a series of commas on a number in order to get it. Yeah. The second piece is it can be attended or assisted. And that is a situation where you can perform it on your own computer. Let me give you an example. I performed a process uh, where I automated a series of report pulls. Okay. I did not, if we didn't have a COE, I could have downloaded it myself and I could have put it on there. By the way, for those from Buckeye that are listening, that is not appropriate. <laughs> However, I could do that. I could do that completely by myself. And now I'm an RPA expert, quote unquote. That's how easy it is to get involved in RPA. And a lot, of these, a lot of these software companies also have training, online training. When you create small barriers, people can climb over them and succeed. And I believe that the, the partner I have with UiPath, being UiPath, but also some of the other software companies like Blue Prism and Automation Anywhere, they've done a fantastic job of getting their product out into the hands of the people. And that's how RPA can get involved very quickly in a business. Well, I mean, there, there's an old saying that, you know, we are collectively more intelligent than any one individual is. Mm-hmm. So if you get it out in the hands of everyone, chances are you'll come up with a more solutions or a better solution than if you just have one or two IT guys trying to come up with it. Because, again, we, we think a lot differently than a lot of the business people do. I will say that one of the benefits that we've seen from RPA is that it creates a collective mindset. Mm. Uh, we, I have found that it's not two people by a water cooler having a conversation about how a process, how a process happens. 
what ends up happening is you have a few people in the room because there's different roles in, in how we address these things. And now you have a more collaborative effort. So from an RPA standpoint, if you build the right structure, you actually have a better solution at the end. Yeah, we have a term we use as collective wisdom. That's mm-hmm. our bridge. So it talks pretty much in line with what, the, what you're saying about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the benefits uh, that I have at Buckeye is, is I have um, very smart colleagues. Yeah, everyone, that's important. Everyone has an opinion, but those opinions are more focused on how do we solve the problem. Uh, and I think that's what that's how RPA um, now and in the future will be successful. All right, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit. You know, we, we're focusing a lot on the, the benefits of RPA, and this is a kind of, so we talk about collaboration and process improvement, but more on the, uh, the larger scale, I guess, uh, the larger scale effects of it is I've heard some rumblings that RPA will allow things to be basically brought back onshore. So you specifically look at manufacturing jobs, call centers, you know, things where you have large presences in, um, in Eastern Asia and, you know, uh, other, other places outside the United States. Do you think that RPA could be a first step in bringing a lot of that stuff back in house, you know, protecting intellectual property and really just kind of, you know, like, like I said, bringing those jobs or the, those processes back into the States? I think it, it will affect everything, um, and it's not localized, no pun intended, to offshore. If they are performing tasks that are rules-based, right, the R in RPA should not be robotics. It should be rules. It's rules processing. If I can take a journey and anticipate all the decisions that are made for RPA, it could be brought into RPA. So the question is more along the lines of what is offshore than necessarily what we're going to take from offshore. And that's that's how when we when we evaluate our processes, it's, you know, how many exceptions do you have? And then the next question is, OK, you have exceptions. How many are really exceptions? How much are preferences? And the straighter the line, the better the accuracy, the better the solution. So one of the, the takeaways that I have from this is that I'm going to stop asking you to predict the future because you give, <laughs> you're giving me some incredibly uh, thoughtful answers that are completely different than what I'm asking you to do. So for the rest of the podcast, we'll see if, if, it, um, if I do throw something at me and let me know, but I won't ask you to predict the future. Anymore. And I'd like to answer that. Uh, the reason why I don't ask about the f- answer any questions about the future, first of all, is um, I have made many predictions uh, that have been wrong. So therefore, I'm comfortable with um, focusing on the present. I also think that everything is moving so quickly that the definition of the future is it could be just months and weeks away. So uh, it's a lesson learned from a a series of uh, uh, bad decisions. All right. Hey, we always say that uh, failure is an opportunity to learn. You either succeed or you learn and you move on. Keep going. And I I learned not to predict the future. Okay. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, so w- with that said, and this is, um, again, I'm not asking to predict the future. I'm just kind of asking for some <laughs> examples. Uh, we use the term when we bring people on in the company, we, you know, industry standard term is onboarding. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I wanted to talk about is that, okay, so let's say we, you know, we've convinced the, all the decision makers and the gatekeepers that we are, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go live with something that we've been testing out. Um, as far as onboarding or bringing up these these RPA bots and and getting them implemented and that initial over the hill to get some inertia going and to start seeing that value, um, what do you think some challenges with that um, with that would be, and how would you kind of mitigate those risks or the challenges and, and from the experience that you have? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, I don't think. As many organizations are, are dealing with that issue, because that would mean there's a large proliferation of RPA projects. I think whenever you have an RPA project or some automation in place, somebody has to take ownership of that automation. It should not be out of sight, out of mind. Therefore, what I would do if I was a manager and I had a proliferation of automations is I would make sure that that person understood what the automations were doing, how it helps them, 
and then ultimately see them some level of expertise on it because they the automation in essence is an FTE is a person now they're not going to go to lunch with you but they're performing tasks and you need to learn how to interact with those automations to make sure not only are you performing in the right sequence right because everything's a conveyor belt so you need to know when you need to jump in to most effectively use the automation but it's also along the lines of how you take that automation and make it more effective all right and Earlier, you mentioned this also is kind of to smooth the process. If you get buy-in from the team, they're typically a lot more, they're a lot less resistant to that change. And I would also assume, and this is just from, again, from my experience, is that as you go through and you look at these these different type of RPA processes and you're, you're improving things and you're going forward, that that in itself is almost a, as much of a justification for the team because they can see they're involved in the planning process they can see what's going on you have their buy-in and it's almost kind of like a kid waiting for christmas oh i want this to hit the ground so that it can it it can start doing this thing and see what happens and see how much of my life is free from this mundane task that i have to do over and over yeah absolutely i mean no one will ever no one will ever sell me as someone who's brief on words Uh, (laughs) i can explain something in three minutes 30 minutes or three days one of, the, one of the most important things as a manager is transparency. You need to be able to communicate a message. You need to be able to communicate a message effectively. And automations are good, but they shouldn't be ignored. And oh, by the way, when you ultimately bring people in, you need to give them the whole picture of how everything interacts. I believe and I have seen people become most successful when you just strip away, because there, there's other people that like to give little bits and pieces of information. Oh, they're not ready to hear that. I would rather provide everything and then, okay, if this is overwhelming, soak in it for a few days. We could revisit this. Because if you don't feel like you're part of a team and you're an individual, you are not going to perform as successfully. I mean, research shows that. We, that gives us good insight on obviously the impact and the steps in terms of reaching that value. Can you talk to me about how that journey starts more specifically around uh, the Center of Excellence COE? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Center of Excellence is one of the the greatest things that I've ever been part of. Uh, It started with uh, sponsorship approval. It was a, started as a conversation uh, the controller of our organization uh, talked about it and had experienced it. Uh, organizations can take the strategy of a complete outsource model, mm-hmm. go all the way to an in-source model. Yeah. But you have to figure out, just like anything else, you have to pilot something. Uh, our organization piloted, and uh, we were satisfied with the results, and we started to move forward. And we had a decision on whether we would... Um, outsource completely or insource, we decided to take the approach that we are going to bring people in to teach us how to do RPA. Our organization uh, created not only the standards of how we are going to move forward on the journey, Mm -hmm. but we also wanted to create a foundation. Because if you're going to train people, you need to give them a path to be successful. Yeah. When, when we talk about Buckeye's path, Buckeye's path, and we've discussed this with other organizations, is two pieces. One is the process analyst side. One is the modeler side. We don't like to use the word developer because we don't want to insult our IT friends. We're not developers. <laughs> we're not as good as you, but we're trying. And, and ultimately, we teach people how to put, put bi- good business requirements together And by putting good business requirements together, you are giving people a complete recipe so the modeler can focus. When we talked about at the very beginning, the gap between the business and IT, Mm -hmm. I've been in those situations. So when we as a collectively as a team put together the COE, we wanted to make sure that we gave a, a strong foundation and training to make sure that the business took ownership and then ultimately transferred it to the business modelers who would take care of that. 
So our COE's foundation is stepping through a normal agile process, Mm -hmm. but making sure there's accountability every step of the way because what people seem to forget is uh, part of our COE group, Eric, who's the head of the IT group for, for the RPA team, the one thing that he has to deal with is if somebody puts something shoddy through production, now he's got to spend time on the support side. So that's why we, we made sure that our path has structure, process, through modeling, validation, and then ultimately automation. Now, I mean, we, we've discussed this a little bit before. So we talked about it a little bit at the the higher, you know, the more executive levels. Like, okay, our competition are getting, is getting into RPA. It's going to have a big ROI, at least eventually. Maybe a little bit of cost to start, but, you know, opportunity cost. But the ROI is going to be there. We've talked about it at the team level where, okay, so we're rolling these bots out and the people that are actually going to be using them or, you know, really working hand in hand with them. We talked about how to you know, get their buy-in and get them going. But as an organizational level, so you have buy-in from the top, you have some people, you know, at effectively at the bottom or mid-level. But let's talk about, take a step back and say, okay, um, how do I get my organization involved in this as a whole? So I know how to pitch it to the, you know, the CIO. This is how I'm going to, you know, throw dollars and cents at him. And he's going to be like, okay, this is awesome. Um, but that doesn't seem like enough to shift the entire mentality of an organization and really kind of get that transfer t- uh, transformation mentality in. So I was wondering, uh, you know, y'all did it by setting up the center, center of excellence, but what are some, I guess, guidelines or principles that someone that, you know, wants to start to, to push this forward can do? And like, how would you suggest, you know, the, 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 how, did, how should they get started? Absolutely. I mean, it starts with... Uh, I'm sorry. Let me let me ask a question about your question. Are you talking about getting it from the ground floor or selling it to the organization? Well, it wasn't really more selling the organization, but I'm talking about having the organization have buy-in about this major transfer transformation that's actually going to happen. So it's like, so we've discussed this on a couple of different podcasts, but we we you know we say you know transform or die. Basically, right. adapt, or, adapt die. or die. Yeah, and a lot of times this uh, this adaption, this change is mess, met with a lot of resistance at every single level. So what I'm thinking about is one of the things that we try to do is we try and shift the focus of the entire company, the organization, to that we have to adapt, we have to transform, we have to change to bring about you know to to stay relevant and to, to continue continue operations. And at each level, that's you're going to have to sell that differently, but. At, for the organization as a whole, mm-hmm. how would you kind of, if you were doing, I don't know, some company event where you had people from every single level. I, I got it, yeah. yeah. I mean, the thought process is first of all, you need to sell, that's my job. Mm-hmm. Um, and and um, I take it very seriously. Um, I have to shake hands and, and really talk to people one-on-one and be transparent, right? I, the, the same conversation that I have with these people are the same conversation I'm having with you today, uh, just not in this long of a form. And really just trying to explain to them, hey, you know what? You know what's important? What's important is you work a lot of hours and there's a lot of things um, that prevent you from working on what you wanna work on that may be the most impactful. If we can remove a few logs off the fire, right? Then that would help you. And it's that conversation. It's it's about asking questions, right? The questions that I'll ask someone are, what do you think's holding you back that we could automate? What do you, what do you see as the three or four things that, that really uh, you come in and you hate, right? What on your team is holding your team back? And if you present it from the standpoint of what exactly we can do and provide a service. You know, we've presented, uh, you know, we've presented to a number of departments. There is excitement about it. Some of the excitement is because it, it's a sexy term. It shows up in a few places. But when you have the conversations, at some point in time, that that sexy term is just a term and it's just going to have its 15 minutes of fame and it walks away. 
So you have to make a commitment. So transparency, making a commitment, and listening, and making sure they understand what the stakes are. I mean, again, as as we said, you, you uh, Stephen here can talk about this for you know days if we want to, but I think we've actually reached a pretty good stopping point for the day. Yeah. Sure. So just to recap, you know, we talked about a brief background of how you came to your position, um, what your position is. Talked about RPA, what the value proposition is. Um, that would entice organizations to even pursue this venture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's some fear about removing jobs or losing jobs, but as you said, it's a it's a balancing act. You have to adapt. You have to grow, uh, especially when you're taking on this kind of project, so to speak. And the, 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 the big takeaway from that is it's not so much about removing, but allowing all of us to do a more valuable, higher order activities and leave the, leave the mundane stuff that we have to deal with on a day-to-day basis, you know, to, to something that can do it so we can really focus on doing what we do well. Yeah. A, a great example is one of the first, uh, when I worked at GE, one of the first jobs I had is I had to reconcile accounts receivable. Um, for those of you that aren't going to fall asleep while I talk about reconciling accounts receivable, please stay with me. I had a green bar report that was like 400 pages Mm -hmm. and I had to sift through that and I'm still not convinced that I actually did it accurately. (laughs) But with systems and everything, things improved. RPA is just a different tool in the tool belt. And whether you call, you know, whether RPA has any fear, the reality is there's a hundred other things going on simultaneously this just comes to the forefront more so than other automations. And I would encourage people to look into this because if, if not RPA, the question you have to ask yourself is, what are you preventing yourself from doing? Because RPA could potentially remove that barrier. All right. That was a great episode with Stephen Fine from Buckeye. Great conversation on RPA. Thanks for joining us if you're still listening on the Transform IT podcast. This is Mirage Juwani and Patrick Pauls. If you liked what you heard today, you can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube. We're now on Spotify. Yeah, join us on Spotify. We're there now. And if you want to learn more, come to our website, transformitpodcast.com, and check out the SmartBridge blog at smartbridge.com forward slash blog. Thanks for joining us. Until next time.